Julie said, grit. I hope grit still lies in these jerseys after I've worn it. If she decides to retire here soon, the U.S. might miss. There's nobody who gets stuck in like Julie Ertz who will risk her body the way that Julie Ertz does. But I just loved that comment. And it was such a, you could tell she had thought about it as well. You know, what is my quote unquote legacy or what do I want to leave behind? And I think that's a really good piece that not just on the field that Julie Ertz could potentially leave, but also off the field. Our job is to now set new standards, higher standards. And, and we have to thank the Ertzes, the Rapinos, the Morgans. Thanks for setting the standard. Thank you. And thanks for, I guess, trying to win the third one. I don't really think you should have been here, but that's, like I said, who's going to turn it down? Who's going to say no to it? Who's gonna, oh, no, come on, come on, she's way better than me. Like, no one's going to ever do that. So I, a lot of this now rests on Blacko's shoulders. Welcome back into Straight from the Pitch. Joined as always by Scotty Schweitzer, I'm Anna Witte. It is the Monday after the U.S. Women's National Team loses to Sweden in penalty kicks. Sweden made five of theirs. The U.S. only made four of theirs. Megan Rapino, Sophia Smith, and Kelly O'Hara missed their penalty kick opportunities. Scotty, what did you think of the penalty kick opportunities? Who was on the field for the United States and was able to take those penalty kicks? And the fact that we had to get to penalty kicks to decide this one. Yeah, um, I always listen to players after they lose and it's always, or, or commentators and penalty kicks is the worst way. It's the terrible way to lose. But to me, it's like, it's been part of the game. It's been part of the game forever. So like, I, I it's only terrible when you lose. It's super exhilarating when you win PK. So like for me, PKs is part of it. Like if you, if you have that bad of a feeling or a taste in your mouth towards PKs, don't get to PKs, take care of your business before. Um, so for that's the first thing I will say this to come in there. And I think it was her first kick of the ball all tournament. And for <laughs> Mewis to bury hers like that, that, that shows you some, uh, really good mental, toughness to come in. I don't think she touched the ball in the, in the one minute that she was in. She luckily that she got in, they got the subs in just in time. And then she goes in there and I mean, just buries it. But like, as you look down who took penalty kicks and when they take them, like there's a lot of things that go on into penalty kicks. You, you know, you have penalty kick contests, you have taken them. Uh, coaches usually have them, have their stats from practices with their club teams. They have their stats from game stuff. So like, I think like Rapino hasn't missed one in three years. I mean, to me is like watching the whole tournament. I don't think I give Rapino one. Just like I don't want to put her in that situation. Like she just wasn't good the whole tournament. Like, and, and I'm not mad at her. She's done amazing things for the game. In her prime, she was one of the best players in the world, like of all time. But like this is Vlaco broader. Like we we said it earlier, she shouldn't have made this trip. Okay, now you go. Like we were talking earlier. Like if Greg Berhalter called me and said, "Hey Schweitzer, uh, we need you to come in and play with the national team." At 52 years old, I'd be like, "Oh, let me get in there. Let me start warming up. Let me like try." Like I shouldn't be there, but like if somebody believes in you, you will start believing more in yourself, and you go, and then you try your hardest. And like she just was her touch was off her passing was off her crossing was off so like you could almost see it like coming like don't put her in there to take a pk i don't think anything good's gonna come from it like that that's just me sitting at home on the couch watching but as a coach like you have to be going through all these things kelly o'hara i don't i don't really ever remember seeing her take a pk in in my time watching her but She's such a good leader. She probably was one of the first people to raise their hand and say, yeah, I want to be on this field. I want to be taking a PK. I want to be a part of this, whether it's the reason we win or the right reason we lose. She just seems like that type of a leader. Um, some of the other players, like I, I don't I don't really know them enough. I'll tell you what, the, the tournament that Germa had, I'd let her take one. Like if she put it out of the stadium, she still should make top 11 of this tournament. I mean, what a beast we have at center back. What, what a tournament she had for her first tournament. She's a rookie last year as a pro, like just what a, what a career is ahead of her. And like, I think we should really start to focus on building around her. Maybe like, I know we have a lot of other great players, but like, I don't remember her doing anything really wrong in the whole tournament. Like she wasn't perfect, but she wasn't wrong. She reminds me of a, a lot better version of Abby Dahl Kemper. She plays long balls when she should. She's even, we, we can play out of the back with her. She stretches defenses. She knows when to play a long ball. But as far as the PKs, like there's too much 
unknown from us unless you're on the team of who takes PKs, who's good at PKs. There's some players that shouldn't be on the field, but man, they can take PKs. And, and you know, we don't know who those players really are because we're not in those penalty shooting contests. Like I remember every third practice, we probably had a penalty shoot contest just to figure out who's going to be taking PKs. And, you know, you have your set PK taker for the game and then you have your best five and then you have six and seven. And, you know, obviously they do it because who would know that Nair could take a PK? I did say though, usually when goalies take PKs, there is no prettiness about it. They just rip them. So like, I thought the goalie should have just stood her ground and then like hope that came down the middle because if she put it anywhere, you weren't saving it just because usually goalies just hit it so darn hard. They just have no – they're not trying to place it. They're just ripping shots kind of a thing. I've never seen three in a row misses, though. That that was – I was shocked because we had two chances to win the whole thing. Right. And then that three PKs just <laughs> – The post – the post, two bad ones in a post. The post is a uh, post saved us against Portugal. I know, as you say, <laughs> killed us against Sweden. Dang, Kelly O'Hara is the one who hit the post, and the players that came on the field to take the penalty kicks. And to your point, you don't know what's happening in training and who's necessarily the best in those opportunities. But Paul Carr tweeted out that Kelly O'Hara hasn't taken a penalty kick since 2021. Christy Mewis was three for three in 2022. I'm curious why if O'Hara hasn't taken a penalty kick in a big game or a game of any type that she was chosen to do so in the round of 16 when the United States really needed her. And Savannah DeMello has been really calm in penalty kick opportunities. I know she's missed one in the 2023 season. However, I think she would have been a better option because she just, in my opinion, plays with a little bit more calmness. And I, you know, I know she's a young player and maybe that's the reason why he didn't put her out there. But a few of those decisions were kind of interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, Sweden got it done in penalty kicks. And you could say, like you said, Scotty, earlier today, you hope it doesn't come down to that, but that's what happened for the United States. So it was penalty kicks, but plenty of soccer happened. Actually, 120 minutes of soccer happened before those penalty kicks happened. So let's start from the beginning. And the biggest thing that we saw was Emily Sonnet started in the six with Andy Sullivan, alleviating some of the pressure that Sullivan has constantly been under in these group stage games Sonnet, in my opinion, had one of the best performances out of anybody on the field. She did her part in winning balls. She's maybe not the most creative player, but I think she connected well with Haran and did what she needed to do in that game against Sweden and stop Sweden in moments, helping out Ertz and helping out Gurma. Sonnet specifically in that six, the U.S., in my opinion, does not need to move to a double pivot going forward. But do you think this gives the United States a glimmer of hope that that's how they need to play in that style of formation going forward, because that was probably the biggest positive out of this match. Uh, I, I definitely do not think that's what we need to think we need going forward. Right. I think that's what we needed for this tournament. But, but, but the question is, do you think the United States thinks that? Do you think uh, they're going to go with it going forward? I, I'm going to hope no. And the reason I'm going to hope no is because I'm hoping the only one who thinks they need to go to the double pivot is Vladko. And who cares what he thinks? Cause I don't think he should be there anymore. So as far as the United States, I don't, I'm hoping the next coach doesn't come in. I, and listen, we, we were pretty hard. Or I was pretty hard on the, on the national team last show. I, I've been very hard on Sonnet. You are correct. She played a pivotal role in this game. She was one of the best players on the field. She is probably the hardest working player but she's also technically one of the least sound players that was out there. She passed a couple balls out of bounds. What, what I thought was very interesting is usually when you put in a double pivot, it's more of a defensive structure it's set up for, which it, which it was, which is exactly why he did it. But what it then did, it allowed Fox and it allowed Dunn to have more confidence that there would be pressure on the ball in the midfield and it allowed them to start to creep forward. And we saw it for sure in the first half where Fox was getting on the ball over and over and over. And it also gave mm -hmm. our, in the first half, Dunn pushed kind of high up on the left and everything kind of pivoted across with uh, Gurma and Ertz. But then Fox was being able to be found on the 
on the ball that was getting switched out from the other side. They would start up that side, come back to Dunn, come back to Germa a lot of times, and then she'd play Fox, and then we would we would attack down with Rodman and Fox on that side. But to me as a coach and as a soccer player, that told me a lot of what Fox and Dunn think of Sullivan. And I'm not saying they don't like her or think she's bad. They just know that she can't cover ground by herself. So in the games prior where she was the only six, those players in the midfield had more time to play more dangerous balls over the top. So Fox and Dunn sat deep, and we basically played that flat back four. But, I mean, we really played a flat back four. We never got pushed high enough and attacked with our outside backs until this game. And we did it out of the double pivot, which that's not really why the double pivot is put in there. It's not what it's what it's best for. Now, granted, we're also in a winner go home Situation. scenario. So we're trying to push the game. We're trying to play the game. We were by far the better game, the better team. We dominated possession. We dominated the game. And again, we just couldn't score. And the problem with that is we're just too predictable up top when you throw that three headed monster that is all the same thing. Alex Morgan, for me, the best thing she did in the whole World Cup was basically her defensive pressure. But I, we don't need that from our nine. We need goals. We, we need services into them and we need goals. But you got Rodman trying to get her goals. Sophia Smith was trying to get her goals. Morgan's trying to get her goals. So they became super predictable. So the defenses could just sit and set and set their lines and then set their zonal, basically zonal defending and let them run right into them, which again happened against Sweden. I mean, we were a little bit better. And then, you know, World Cup, NHL hockey, you do not want to come across a hot goalie. Right. They can win the game on their own. And that's basically, we, we came across a hot goalie who was amazing today. And she won the game for her team. She, I mean, she did it all. She did everything. She saved everything she possibly could get her hands on. And she didn't just save them, man. She either caught them or she got them out and it got them away. And, and she was just amazing in goal. Yeah, Musevich is the goalkeeper for Sweden, and she plays her club play in Chelsea. She was insane, standing on her head at multiple points and made 11 saves from the U.S. And that shows that the U.S. had progressed out of group stage play. Like, their play was so much better than we had seen prior. And I think Andonovsky, to give him credit, made some really good tactical changes that were pretty small. They weren't massive in anything that they couldn't handle in four days. But the way that I thought the U.S. switched the point of the attack, the way Rodman was able to live on the ball a little bit more, and even that ball where Haran had her back to goal and Rodman made that run inside and all Haran had to do was pass like a very small short pass. We hadn't seen anything that creative out of the U.S., in the group stage play. And that's something I would have loved to see the U S capitalize on and get some confidence going forward. Alex Morgan didn't have a goal in this world cup. Trini Rodman didn't have a goal in this world cup. It was Lindsay Horan with two goals and Sophia Smith with two goals. And that shows this U S attack that is supposed to be so dynamic and is supposed to be so cohesive. Didn't do that at all in the world cup and Megan Rapino coming on the field, Lynn Williams coming on the field. They're doing the same exact thing that who they subbed out are doing. Trinity Rodman's running down the flank. That's what Lynn Williams is trying to do. How can the U S use what they saw in the world cup and film as they look? And now they got to scout younger players heading into the Olympics this upcoming summer, obviously the world cup four years from now. So I, I think, and again, <laughs> We're not there. But as you like now dissect the whole tournament as far as the U.S. And, and the, a big thing for me is I hope the American fan, the American younger fan, the American coaches don't stop watching the World Cup because the U.S. is out. Yeah, like, we can learn from all these teams like Spain. I, man, I hope Spain wins because they deserve it the way they're playing. And I know Japan beat them, but they're not as Japan's not as good as Spain. Japan is super technical, super intelligent a real good team. They do what's necessary as a team, but they know they're not as good as Spain. That's why they did a counterattacking soccer. When they played against Norway, they said, we're better in possession, so we'll play like Spain. And they possessed and they destroyed Norway. What, what we're learning from the World Cup too is, one is, man, the parity is getting so much better. The, the, the countries are getting better. The players are getting better. So we can't use route one soccer anymore because all the countries that really – are used to playing that route one game, Norway, mm -hmm. US, Germany, Canada. Like, and, and they don't just play that, but that's a big part of their game. They're all home. 
They're all done. They're all done playing. And the teams that can knock the ball around and move the ball and then use different, they use speed here, they use passing here. And all they're trying to do is get defenses to shift and slide and get disorganized. The way we play, the defenses are never getting disorganized. They can stay in their lanes. They can stay on their lines. They can stay in their connections and they can stop us. But what, what, what it looked like to me is we have a real good core of younger players. We have a core of older players who won two World Cups already and had amazing careers. Like, Rapino was terrible. She was terrible. But she was brought. She was brought there. That's Vlaco's decision to bring her. We've been saying don't bring her. Like, there had, there, there were, maybe somebody else could have came in and done something different. Like, sometimes the game just, our time is done. Our time is gone. Like, so was there a little bit of like, Hey, it's still your team. Show us the way. Whereas maybe we needed some of these younger players to say, hey, thanks for showing us the way the last two World Cups. But now we got to take it over and we got to do it our way. Mm -hmm. It almost looked like players were doing things that weren't really their style of play because that's the way we won the last two World Cups. But the teams are different. The the quality's better. And and that's where, where we have to take a look at it and say, you know, Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for setting this standard. But now, like, now we have to set a higher standard. We have to. We have to become better. We have to win tournaments. Uh, uh, we talked about it earlier. Vlaco was in the Olympics with this team, and he was also in this World Cup. And that was 10 total games that he's coached in these big tournaments. Yeah. And he has four total wins. Mm-hmm. Four. Like, that's not good enough. We, we should have known we were in trouble Earlier in this cycle for the World Cup, when we played the three European teams and we went 0-3, and it's the first time that that's ever happened, and it was all European clubs that play a different brand. Grant, I think Germany was in, in, in there and they played. Then Spain came in and just tore us apart. But, like, we have to let, recognize the game is changing and we have to adapt to it. We have the ability to adapt. And that's, like we going back to last week, youth coaches have to change their we, – we have to be able to – problem solve we, we never were able to problem solve we ever oh they're going to do this on us then we need to do this we just said we're going to keep doing what we do no work for the last two world cups it's going to work sooner or later and now we're sitting at home because it didn't work and like yes penalty kicks are terrible but like we said that shouldn't even have been our game we shouldn't have been in that game we should have won the group we should have done our job in the group and we don't get sweden who listen if sweden was 70th in the country in the world for some reason for whatever reason they play us tough it's a hard matchup it's not like it's the first time they've ever seen them they they we both know each other the game was much better from us but it was kind of a sloppy there was a lot of fouling the referee let a lot of fouls go but it was a sloppy kind of a a game it wasn't like real fun and and like you watch spain or japan and it's just pure class on the field it's just enjoyable i mean i put us i'm smiling the whole game in the, when I watch the U S it's like, you're all tense and you're, you know, we, we need to be able to have a little bit more flow to our game. But like I said, we need to be able to problem solve. And right now this team that we put out this world cup, we were real bad at problem solving coach included. So like he put in, yes, he did a great job with the double pivot, but would he have done that if Rose Lavelle was playing? I don't think he would have. I, I think we would have stayed the same. I don't think he would have went to the double pivot. And what if we win the PKs? Because now Lavelle's back. Would he have stayed with the double pivot? Even That's the best we've played all, all tournament. That, that was our best game by far. Would he have stayed to it or would he put Lavelle back in? Like, those are just, we're never going to know those questions. But, like, some of the things he did, I think kind of, that's all, he, that was his really only option. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you're going to take Haran out. So you're not going to change your 10. Uh, obviously, he he gave Morgan his shot. He, he kept subbing in. In this game, as that game went, and as you're watching the game, like real early in the game, like the first 10 minutes, I said, man, Sweden is deathly afraid of our speed up top. They are not even trying to get forward. They are totally petrified. So then when you sub at the end and you bring Rapino in, she hasn't had a good tournament. She hasn't been fast for two years. She, she wasn't good with free kicks so that you couldn't have been bringing her in for that because she hadn't been real good on free kicks. So where was Thompson? Like bringing another – that they were scared of our speed? Give them some more speed. They were subbing players out because they were cramping. They were subbing players out because they were tired because they were chasing us all game. Yeah. So like I think some of our subs had to be more on like 
the offensive and not the same. Like Alyssa Thompson is a little different than Rodman, is a little different than Lynn Williams, is a little different than even Sophia Smith. So I think some of it was just like some of the choices he made were just easy choices for him. And then some of the choices that he should have made, he didn't make. And I think he just stayed with the status quo that he's been doing since he basically took over the team. Yeah, and I think with the Alyssa Thompson substitute, uh, with Alyssa Thompson in general coming into the national team, that's a huge positive coming out of this World Cup. You have a young player who was in her first year in NWSL and professional play, had only had four caps. Now she's been to a World Cup. She's seen this team lose. Maybe she didn't get as many minutes as she had hoped. However, moving forward into the Olympics, into the World Cup, I think she's going to have a not necessarily a massive leadership role, but she's going to have that experience that other players can lean on her for. And when she's 18 years old, I think that's a huge positive that the U.S. can take out of this World Cup is just getting a young player that experience. She's not physically as strong as Sweden, and I could see Ananovsky being nervous as a physical matchup to put her in that game. And they had also kind of mentioned Trinity Rodman wasn't feeling well, and even though she was playing so well, it's a bummer that maybe she wasn't feeling up to her normal abilities to continue to go because I agree with you. I don't think Lynn Williams is the proper sub. She's fast as all heck, but she cannot trap a ball and put it in a spot that somebody else can convert. I mean, there were multiple crosses that she put inside the box where she had all the time to do so because she was able to separate herself from her defender because she's so quick, but the pass was just over the top. Even the goalkeeper didn't even go for it because it just was out of nowhere. So I don't think Lynn Williams would have been the proper sub in that piece. And we've mentioned Rose Lavelle getting the double yellow, wasn't able to play against Sweden. So they went with the double pivot and Lindsay Horan. Ashley Sanchez, I could see why he didn't play her in this game because she's a true 10 and he played with the double pivot. However, if you're not going to use Ashley Sanchez in this World Cup and you're Vlako Andonovsky and going to go into your post-game press conference and mention on top of a bunch of other young players that Ashley Sanchez, Trini Rodman, et cetera, et cetera, will leave a mark on this team in the future, why not use that young player in this World Cup to get her ready for said future? To me, leave her name out of your mouth in a post-game situation after you've lost because you didn't use her at all. You didn't show that you have confidence in her. And I think that was to me, one of the biggest misses that he had in this world cup was not using Ashley Sanchez and that Rodman dynamic movement. And she's so creative. She's so special. I think she's so different in that 10 role. And it's one of those things that she could have blown it in this world cup, but she also could have been the reason that we moved forward and we would never know. And to say that she's part of the future is odd. Yeah, I, I think there's like when, when you watch the game and, and, you know, you start to dissect it, there, I think there's a lot of things he could have done. And I think Sanchez is one of the answers to that or DeMello or w- the way that Sweden and all the teams have been setting up their back four pretty much stays compact and together. They very rarely attack out of the back teams because if they do, then there's danger if we win it and get forward because it's just too hard to cover us. But if you take out an Alex Morgan and you sub in a Sanchez or a DeMello and you play him at like the false nine, really as a 10, well, now you have two and you're saying to their two center backs, one of you better come forward because if you don't, then we're going to get a run at you from 10, 15 yards away. And that's a hard thing for center backs. So one of the center backs is probably going to step into the midfield. Or they're going to drag their six deeper, which gives our midfield a little bit more time on the ball for better passing. But if it drags their two center backs, one of them drags forward. Now we have the ability to make diagonal runs, which our runs are never diagonal. They're just straight down. Lynn Williams, straight into the corner. Rodman, straight into the corner. Sophia Smith, straight into the corner. Alex Morgan, straight towards the goal. She has the most diagonal, and it's really just slight diagonals to one of the posts basically it never gets out super wide and when i say never i don't mean like it never happens i'm just saying most of her runs are right here so like once you see her take off you don't even really track her you just know where she's going so you track to the space that you know where she's going to end up and it makes it super easy to play against her so like i think we could have made like weird adjustments like that and said here now what are you going to do i got haran and sanchez basically playing the box Kind of like when, uh, yikes, Paul Riley was with the courage. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really a box, but he played this four midfield 
these four midfielders, and then he played McDonald and Lynn Williams wide. Usually when you play a, a 4-4-2 box almost, you play your two center forwards kind of like connected. Well, he didn't. He made them stretched. So he kept everything stretched in the back because they were so scared of their speed out wide. And then these players came out through the midfield. It was when Dabinia was just, just scoring goals like for the fun of it because no one knew whose job it was to pick her up. And she was able to get forward and sneak forward on her own terms. And I think that could have worked against Sweden. Like it's a, it's a winner go home. And I don't think he made enough tactical adjustments to say, I'm not trying to go to PKs in a sense. Like we, we, come on, we, we are the ones that are supposed to be getting through. Sweden's not the, like the one that was supposed to be getting through. We were the ones supposed to be getting, we're number one in the world. And I don't think he went for games like, we need to go for it. Like we need to go get some goals. We're, we're we got we got a little joy today. We got a little fun. Let let's let's add to it. Let's let's be a little bit risky. Let's take some risk here. He just plays it so safe to me. Mm-hmm. And just watching his interaction with some of the players, it's like he felt like he old older players. He owed them like minutes, minutes. or so. I, I don't understand. Like you brought Sanchez there. She had been starting a lot of friendlies. Alana Cook had been starting a lot of friendlies, and they don't, they don't, they don't get a minute. Like well, they got used to the travel, and they got used to being at a World Cup stadium, but they didn't get used to playing. They didn't get used to the pressure of being out there. And I think that was kind of like I, I would love to see what I'd love to hear what was it two teams, an older team and a younger team. I, I don't know. They didn't really ever seem like that necessarily, but like there was something off. There was. There was no chemistry with this team. It was, it was like they were all trying to do it for their own themselves, not for the team and everything. And, and that's a shame because, we, like I said, we've got tons of talent. I don't think it's anything to panic about, but we do need to make slight adjustments and, and learn the game better and, and learn how to break defenses down and learn what's being thrown at us. And, and as the next coach comes in, you have to realize, like, look at Spain. Look, it's, they're changing their lineup. Sweden's changing their lineup. Sweden started their outside back, right back. Then they satter the last game, thinking they're going to get through, thinking they're going to get the U.S. and they needed to rest her. Like, that's what the tournament's all about. Like, it is day in and day out you're, you're making adjustments because it's a long, long tournament. If we get through, if we would have won today in PKs, man, we're going to be carrying some tired legs. Haran's been carrying tons of minutes. Ertz has been carrying tons of minutes. Like these younger players, they don't just need to get in the game. They need to spell players too. They need to let, like, we can all win this tournament. Like if I'm Sanchez, I'm thinking like, I wasn't the reason we won. I wasn't the reason we lost. I was just here. Right. Like, I, so like, if you are to the same. Where to the same. I mean, Mewis, thank goodness she scores it because like, what a, what a tough situation to be put into. Like here, go out there for a minute and then make a PK in the world cup, your first world cup. Like that's just like, well, that's a lot of pressure to put on a player. Totally. A ton of pressure. And I think to the fact that you had mentioned that maybe Andonovsky won't be here after this world cup. And that's where I would like the U S to trend is getting somebody else in this system and adjusting to new players. However, if you are an Ashley Sanchez, you are a Savannah DeMello, Maybe not a Christy Mewis because Mewis is a little bit older and in this next World Cup cycle, she likely won't be a part of it. But if you are some of these players, Alana Cook, who are on the fringe, so to speak, because they didn't play any minutes in this World Cup, are you nervous about maybe a new coach coming in and wanting to play a different style and you not fitting that system in the future? Of the players you mentioned, I am not nervous because I think those are the type of players that is what the game is going to need to be starting to be played like. Fair. Like when we watch yeah. Spain, Japan, and like, I'm going to keep mentioning them. They just, you can't help but wake up at three in the morning if they're on. Mm-hmm. Like, I think Australia has had a pretty decent tournament, but I I, I don't see them as a favorite to win this thing. I, they play, they're the next route one kind of a team to go, I think. I think England was a route one team, and they have made their adjustments and started playing differently. A couple years ago, they saw where it was going. They saw where it was trending. They were playing against the French national team. They were playing in their league and saying, hey, the game is changing. We can't just go and use our size and strength. Everybody's getting better. All the teams are getting better. All the country are putting resources into their women's team. And, like, it's 
like that's what I'm saying here in the U.S. Like I think we have the the nucleus, and they're young. Like I just saw it today, the next World Cup. Like these girls, I don't think any of them will be 28 years old of the core. Like they're they're super young. They're 23. They're like they're they're going to be still in their they're going to be in their prime prime 28, 27, 25. We have a lot of young players that just made this trip and that the next one's coming up, the Coffees, the Weavers, the, the players that, you know, maybe weren't on his radar for whatever reasons, they're going to be on. Um, I know Ert said probably, but, like, it seemed like yeah. she knew she knew where it was going. Rapino knows that that was her last kick for the national team, unless we bring her in for these next two friendlies to say goodbye, kind of how we did with Carly Lloyd when she was uh, – on her way out. There's some players that they know their, their time is done and they're done. And they said, you know, they were saying, Oh, the, the team's in great hands with the young generation. Like, I think we should have recognized that a year ago, two years ago and said, Hey, you know what? We're going to bring you into camps, older players, but not necessarily going to bring you to the world cup, but your job is to get that third win for us, that third world cup title. And like, you have to do everything that you possibly can give us your, your experience, give us your information, and then don't be sad when we don't pick you. Because I think we have a nucleus to do it. I don't think we have the right coach to do it. Um, but I think we have a nucleus, and I think there's another crop of players waiting to get their turn that in a four-year gap, we we can make these adjustments. And, and then with the younger generations, I think the younger generations, the youth players, I think they're behind. So we have to do a better job of teaching them to get them at the levels of the Sanchez's of the Thompson's. I don't think our 17s are of the same quality just yet. I know we won the, the U 17 world cup. I know we lost in the finals of the twenties to Mexico, but I don't think there's still the same quality of what we had in the past and what we have right now. But I don't think it's anything for us to say, Oh no, we're not going to be number one. We're going to be like, our job is to now set new standards higher standards. And and we have to thank the Ertzes, the Rapinos, the Morgans. Thanks for setting the standard. Thank you. And thanks for, I guess, trying to win the third one. I don't really think you should have been here, but that's, like I said, who's going to turn it down? Who's going to say no to it? Like, oh, no, come on, come on. She's way better than me. Like, no one's going to ever do that. So I, a lot of this now rests on Blacko's shoulders. Like, he didn't do a good enough job. He didn't take enough risk. He's, he's to me, he's, he always plays it safe. And Look at where safe got us. We're getting, yeah. we're coming back home. Yeah. After the round of 16, I think too, we have to hope and really continue to strive home as just a nation in general, that whoever's going to take over potentially this world cup, if us soccer decides to move on from Ananoski, it has to be somebody who sees that these large changes need to be made sooner rather than later. And it would be interesting too. the U S plays South Africa at the end of September on the 21st and the 24th. I hope that we see the Sam Coffees, the Morgan Weavers, the different players in the NWSL who are playing really well and allow them minutes in these upcoming U.S. soccer games just to see how they can fit and flow with different players. Obviously, you want to get Ashley Sanchez some minutes, maybe Alana Cook, because the future of Julie Ertz is up in the air based off of what she said. So what Julie Ertz mentioned Everyone has said on the internet that she has retired, but what she said was it's probably the last time I will wear this crest. She didn't say she's definitely for sure. She was definitely emotional about it. And I think the biggest thing that stood out to me and when Ertz was talking to Jenny Taft after the match, when Jenny asked her, what do you want this U.S. team to take away from you? And Julie said, grit. I hope grit still lies in these jerseys after I've worn it. And I love that because – We've talked about Julie Arts even before we knew she was coming back to the NWSL in 2023. That's the piece of her game that we've always liked. And that's what we've always liked about Arts. That's what the national team has always liked about Arts. And we were able to see that in this World Cup. She's a very gritty player. And I think that's one piece that if she decides to retire here soon, the U.S. might miss. There's nobody who gets stuck in like Julie Ertz who will risk her body the way that Julie Ertz does. And yes, this World Cup wasn't her best performance compared to years past. And her at her prime was insane. And she's so strong. She's so smart, so gritty. But I just loved that comment. And it was such a, you could tell she had thought about it as well. You know, what is my quote unquote legacy or what do I want to leave behind? And I think that's a really good piece that 
not just on the field that Juilliards could potentially, but also off the field. On that, and I agree with you. I, I think I think a lot of players need to realize, <laughs> especially in America, and I'll make my point about that why I laugh in a second. But talent is not enough, and we need to realize that talent can only get you so far. You need other things. You need these other intangibles and grit and determination and hard work and and self-discipline and self-esteem. Those are all super important. So just being really talented doesn't really get me where I need to get to. And I say that and laugh because I've been training some kids and, and now Messi is, you know, just amazing <laughs> and yeah. tearing up the MLS. But he, he walks around on the field. Now, this is a 36-year-old player who's been playing for, good God, who knows how long. And he's walking not because he's lazy, because he's just that much more intelligent. And he's done all the work to be able to walk. So, like, we don't want these young players to walk around like, hey, I'm messy. I'm blah, blah, blah. I only run when I can score. Like, no, no, no. He, he is moving and getting into positions even though he's walking. And he's still tearing defenses apart. He's not just tearing defenses apart because it's MLS. He's tearing everybody apart he tore the world cup apart eight months ago or whatever it was he, he's going to tear the mls apart if he went to another league he'd tear that apart so we have to realize that there's that there's other things that we need besides talent we have the talent now we need the other intangibles also on that we have a few players that good god they have and i understand there's more games now games make money they they, they sell out stadiums so we play more games than we ever have as a national team but if you have a player that has 200 caps, that means you also have players that have zero caps, that needed caps, that needed to play, that needed to get into games, that needed to be in an environment, that needed to be around players. So I think we should be very leery of, we have a lot of players that are carrying over 100 caps, which back in the day was unheard of. Now, granted, you didn't play as many games back in the day that we do now, but still, like, these players need to get into games. They need to, and not just any game. Like we need to bring over European competition. Whoever wins the World Cup now, let's get a scrimmage with them. Let's get a friendly with them. Let's get a friendly against Spain as many times as we can. Let's play against the Japans as many times as we can. Let's play the different styles of soccer. Let's see how we react to it. Let's see what adjustments we make. Let's see which players play good against certain teams and bad against other teams. So you know going into tournaments, who needs to play against what team and what game and where? Like, we can't always be, oh, let's just throw these 11. It's going to work. It always works. It always going to work. The game has changed. The game is better. We asked for better. The U.S. asked for better. Asked for more. Well, we got it. On top and, and, go ahead. No, I was just saying, on top of everything you just said, is let's get those, those European teams playing against the United States. Let's also sub against those European teams. See who's good coming off the bench. See who is good when they only play 60 minutes. There's so many different things that they can do in those moments that are on such a low stage in friendly games that the U.S. didn't do at the World Cup, that these opportunities could present opportunities that are just seamless when they go to the Olympics and go to the World Cup in four years. Yeah, I just like I think we need to make these these adjustments now. And and when when you want to be, we want to be the best. And I said it last show. It's not that it's easy to be the best, but it's a lot easier becoming number one than staying number one because now everyone's chasing you. Okay, well after this, I don't see how we're gonna stay number one. So okay, now we become a chaser again. But what what has happened and and it's the good thing is. Usually, and especially in soccer, especially like if you're doing what when I deal with the younger players, our drills and everything are catered to the top player. That that's we know what the top player can do, so that's the drill. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we make sure the bottom player gets it and we make sure they get it really good. The best players, the best in any environment, they're self driven. There's just this competitive edge that they have. So when you get these weaker players and weaker talented players becoming better, it pushes these top players. Because it pushes the top players, then we can take our drills and we can change them again, focusing on what the top player can do, but we go back to the bottom players and we push them forward. The pushing of the bottom players forward pushes the top players to become better. And that's that's in like in a club environment or in, in next level where we're doing technical training environment. Mm -hmm. But it, we can see it's also worked on the global stage. 
These other teams that weren't as good have now have become and they're chasing and becoming good. And it's forcing the top teams to become that much better. Spain was good seven years ago. Good God, they're amazing right now. And and we've been I've been listening and reading stuff about, oh, well, we had Mewis was out and Sauerbrom was out and this player was out. And so and the the Brazilian girl, she's out. Spain's missing eight starters. They played with their fourth string goalie played last game, who's never played a game ever. It was our first international <laughs> cap ever. Like that's what's happening. The game is we, we've asked for the game to be better. We asked for better competition. We asked for equal pay. We asked for equal. We're getting other countries to do it too. And to fight for injustices. Well, now everybody's getting better. So let it drive us. Let it drive us. Don't hide from it. Don't be scared of it. Don't make excuses about it. Let it drive us. We have a core. We have a young group of players that are still hungry. It's now like if, if I'm in that locker room, I'm saying thank you. If I'm the coach and I'm saying it's your team now. It's yours. Drive us. Become the leaders. I don't know if I'll be here if I'm black. I don't know if I'm going to be the coach. It doesn't matter who becomes the coach. This is your team now. Drive us the way you want it to go. Mm -hmm. Make it go. Na Naomi Gorman, make us go. No more. You don't have to be, oh, let Ertz talk. Let Kelly O'Hara. No, you got something to say? Say it. You want, you want to train a certain way? Somebody's not doing, holding up their end of the bargain, doing the standards that we have set? Push them. Get it where it needs to be done. And that's what I think is like, I, I think she said some things and, and they were kind of out of almost spitefulness. But like when Carly Lloyd was a player, that's one of the reasons we were good. She, she was a driving force. She pushed us. Mia Hamm was a driving force. Lily, Kristen Lee was a driving force. Abby Wambach was a driving force as a leader. Like they pushed the envelope. They kept pushing. If somebody wasn't doing enough, they let them know it. You didn't need a coach to get on a player. And now these younger players, now it's your turn. Don't wait for it. Alyssa Thompson, I don't care that you're 18. You've been in a World Cup. You are now a pro. Your rookie year is halfway done. You're not a rookie anymore. Now, if we're going to be great, we need these players to step step up and say, this is what they did in the past. This is what we need to do. And the funny thing is, I think the younger players now are more talented than the players that are about to leave. I think we're more talented than the Morgans. We're more talented than the Rapinos. We're more talented than the Ertzes. We have better players, but do they have that leadership quality? Do they have that tenacity? Do they have that grit? That's what we're about to find out because talent is not enough. Yeah, no, I completely agree with everything you said. And we talk about the technical changes, the tactical changes that the U.S. has to make moving forward, making sure mentally that these players and these individuals have the, tangi the tangibles to continue to be a lead and continue to be the leaders and know what that takes. And I think there's ways that the Federation can support that and making sure that they have the right tools to make sure that they're always mentally prepared for those moments. And like you said, this, the U S getting knocked out of the round of 16 is inevitable. Eventually, you know, the U S can't always be on top. Nobody can always be on top. Was it Rome back? They were on top back in the day and look at Rome now. Like, it's just like things fall and that's okay. And it's the response is the most important aspect to that. And I think the United States, just to drive home what you said, has the pieces, but the biggest piece is going to be the head coach moving forward. To me, that head coach isn't Blacko Andonoski, and it's going to have to be somebody who is evaluating NWSL talent, who's evaluating just talent across the states, individuals who are in college or going into college. What are they good at? Who plays well next to Germo? What you mentioned Germo being a, a player that the U.S. can build around. The next head coach should figure out who is the best player and what does Gurma not have that the other center back should have or the right back that Gurma plays next to should have. There's so many small things and there's plenty of time for the U.S. to figure that out. You just hope that the Federation makes those next steps soon. Um, and like you said, Scotty, there's plenty of soccer left to be played. Really good soccer. In fact, it starts it's with great soccer. yeah, Nigeria and England play tonight at 3.30 a.m. Eastern time. What game in this round of 16 are you most excited for? We got four left. Well, I'm really excited for the England-Nigeria game. I just want to see, can England put another masterpiece? I mean, it was a masterpiece, their last game. But now you're going to play Nigeria, who's – very confident, very, very happy with the way they've been playing, and they're super athletic. And they have 
what we didn't have. They have a chemistry. Nigeria has a chemistry. They, they, they seem to really enjoy playing with each other. They seem to feed off of each other's talents, off of each other's strengths. Um, so I want to see if England can put another piece, another game like they put together before. I just, if they can, man, we, I mean, like, that's what I said. I hope the American public doesn't turn off the games now and everybody goes back and like soccer's over because we're out. Like watch, watch the games and, and fans don't be against the U S but don't make excuses for them either. Yeah. Like, like that's what, that's one of my biggest problems with like fans of their home team. It's always like, Oh God, ah, like, listen, I don't know if that ball crossed the line or didn't cross the line. I don't care what they show me on a video. Like it's a picture. Like I never believe Wimbledon either. When they show me like, I, why isn't it like, why isn't it the real picture? like, stop the screen. We have technology that can do it. Why is it? Why did these referees not have their watches on? I don't want to make excuses. We didn't play good enough. We got what we deserved, but now we need to make fixes. So like, let's not make excuses in the, the, the Italian coach. And I don't think Italy underachieved. I think that's just, they're not great yet. They're, they're coming along. They just got a league, but in other countries, when they don't meet the standards that they hold for themselves, they resign. Like I, if, if Vlatko has to be fired, I think that's a problem. I think he should know, like, I'm not the guy for the job. I'm, I'm, I love the job. I love the players. And if you truly love them, then we, you know we underachieved. And you're mm -hmm. a huge part of that. So step down. You'll get another coaching job. You're still a decent coach. You can coach in a pro league. You can coach somewhere. But this is not the job for you. you you've proven that. So take the high road. Don't wait to be fired. And it seems like in the U.S. we're always, if they don't fire me, I'm not leaving. Like, as, as, like the Italian coach stepped down. She resigned. She's done wonders for that country. They're so far advanced from where they were before she took it over. She's leaving it in a better place. But she thinks, I've got it to where it can be. Now, now somebody else has got to take it from here and, and keep it going forward. And, you know, like, I don't know what's going on at Spain and why they don't like this coach. I, I'm not there. But good God, he's doing, a he's doing a wonderful job. He's changing up his lineup. The players play for him. They play a great brand of soccer. They're intense. He is, you can see that he holds them to a really high standard, but at the same time, like they scored an own goal to make it 1-1 and he never lost his mind. Their yeah. assistants were losing their mind more than him. He was like, he's like, steady the ship. We're the best team. Play our game. Don't change anything. After the Japan game, he said, great, great. Now we know how a team counterattacks us. We'll make our adjustments. We'll fix our things. We'll make it better. I'm glad we got to see it. Like he didn't make any excuses for it. Like, I, and I don't think we need to. And I, as the fans, I, as I'm saying like, don't lose hope. Don't say we're the worst in the world. Don't say we're terrible. Oh, we're going to be 70. No, we're right there. We're going to be in top five. We got to get back to one and we got to get dominating again, but don't make excuses. I think excuses are getting us to where we are. And on that, just real easy to see it. I am a Miami fan and I couldn't watch them play in the MLS. It was so bad, such terrible soccer. Lionel Messi shows up and Busquets. And I know Jordi Alba's there, but he's just gotten there. And all of a sudden, Robert Taylor's playing like he should be playing for Man United or Liverpool or Man City. Like they got there and they changed the standard. Just getting there and doing your job wasn't good enough. You have to be great at your job. You have to concentrate the whole time. And now Miami looks like they're world beaters. Like it's not just Messi killing everybody. Yeah. Martinez is playing better. Taylor's no. playing better. DeAndre Yedlin's playing better. Their two center backs are playing better. Their holding midfielder's playing better. Busquets is helping everything along. The goalie's playing better. Like that's just because these guys came in and were like, just maybe by the way they train or their presence, the whole team, Martino's there too, the coach. But everything's different. The players are like, that's, and that's what we said, like that first show, like when Robert Taylor hit that chess off his chest and volleyed. And I said, why can he do that? And then the next play, he kicks it out of bounds. Well, now he's not kicking it out of bounds. Like every play is important. Every practice, every touch, every run, every day, every fitness drill, every diet, taking care of your body, everything's important. And the standard can never lower. And, and I think that's what, like, that's my problem with, we can't just like, oh, I made the national team. That's good enough. No, no, no. Now we have to, what they built before us, we have to continue to build upon. And when my time is done and I can't help build anymore, then I have to step away, whether that's me as a player, whether that's me as a coach. 
And the ones that do it, I think go down in, in a bigger sense of the history of the game. Mm -hmm. Because Rapino, like I said, amazing player. Like, we can't, don't take anything away from her. But for the next couple of months, all we're going to remember is this tournament. And that's a shame for her. Because she did so much for the women's game. She's done so much. But she was put in a spot where, I mean, we called it. She wasn't going to be good in this World Cup. <laughs> yeah, said, I mean, it doesn't take it. We see it, and Vlaco doesn't see it like that. Right. Like, if we can see it and he can't, then maybe we should be hired the wrong person. Like, and, that, and that's, you know, the Federation hires who they want to hire. You mentioned Messi coming in to Miami and changing the team and how Robert Taylor has improved so well. The fact that he's able to find players the ball in, in ways that he had never been able to do before Busquets and before Messi arrived. And that shows that when people come into any professional setting or any setting that's competitive in general, if people are better other people who aren't as good are going to want to compete and be able to get on that level and be able to play with them and be able to show that maybe they can be even better than said person, not messy. But you know what I'm saying? Like any talented person coming into a competitive setting, no matter who you are, but if you're just a general competitor, you're going to want to raise your game as well. And I think that's what you see out of Messi is he's raising everyone around him because he's phenomenal at what he does, but he has a standard. He's no BS. And that is the way it's always been for him. And for the United States, they don't have that player. There's nobody who walks into that team and is means complete business, who is a total stud on and off the field, who doesn't allow the outside noise or anything that's happening outside of the game to affect what they're doing to raise the standard of the team. And I'm not saying what the U S has done for the women's game off the field and for other federations wasn't necessary. It totally was, but I just think the U S doesn't have that messy or that Busquets that everyone is trying to be just as good as, and maybe in some ways they're just allowing themselves to be mediocre because that's just been allowed for the U.S. for so long. That's what Miami was allowed to be for so long was mediocre until Messi Busquets come up, you know? I think we had it. It was Ertz. I, and I think that's why we won too, because we had it. Back we in the day, Ertz. yeah. Sure. Yeah, right. And I said, and, and like this one is why they tried so hard to get her back on the team and get her back into fitness and get her there. But the problem with it is when you take two years off and you have a baby and you have a slight injury, those thoughts creep into your own head. So it's hard to be the leader that's pushing everybody because you don't know if you can push. Like at the end of my career, that was one of the reasons I retired. I didn't, I was fighting my own demons inside. Am I still good enough? Can I still push this team? Can I? And now it's hard when you have a bad day to be like, come on, you can be better. But I just had a crappy day. Yeah, well, right. Yeah, I had a crappy day because I'm 35 years old and you're 18. Like, but like, you, when you're on your game and you're playing great, it's easy to be the leader. When you're struggling to get back and not sure if you can get back, now it's you're, you're trying to internally take care of yourself. And I think that's, listen, she was still really good and we did as good as we could do with, because she was there, Ertz. But she wasn't that, she wasn't the engine for us. She wasn't able to be the engine. And, and I think that's what we need to be looking for. And, you know, I, I think Haran has it. A little bit, but I don't know if she has it to the dynamic that we need it. And and I agree, like you need the problem in the US is a lot of us are fighting for our legacy, our personal legacy. Whereas it seems to me like great European players, they're fighting for the legacy of I'm at Real Madrid. They don't want to let Real Madrid down. They, they Real Madrid has a legacy. It has a history, and they want to build upon it. Barcelona has this. Like these old Barcelona players are dying right now because Barcelona had the problem financially, couldn't keep players. Mm -hmm. They're back. Who did they bring back? They brought back the old guard to take it over. That's why Xavi became the coach because he knew what it took. So their leader, their engine is on the sidelines coaching them. Whereas Miami now has Messi and. Just the way he goes about his business on the field, he's chirping with players. He's talking trash. He's getting fouls. He should have probably had a red card the last game, but he didn't. But like that, he's trying to say like he's trying to make something. He he can't play forever, but he's going to try to leave Miami in a great place when he's done, so that they're always the best team. And I think that's a problem in the U.S. is 
We are fighting for our own personal legacy. Oh, well, look at me. And I'm not saying any of them done it, but since the women's just finished, like, hey, I won to. Not my fault we lost. If we would have had all our old players, if Mewis would have been here and didn't hurt her knee, like, it just seems like that sometimes, like, to me is like, like, okay, you're on your way out. Let's make it better. Like, for me, and I'm an NC State guy. I go to NC State. We're 500 my freshman year. We keep getting better. We go to the final four my sophomore year. We go to the final eight. We're like the best team in the country my junior year. And then my senior year, I'm a senior. We got a whole bunch of freshmen, and it's the first time we're ever number one. And then I leave, and I'm like, sweet, NC State's in good hands. I want greatness for NC State. I want them to win a, a national championship, even though I'm not there. Like, I want it. And then it kind of spirals downhill, and there's different coaches come in, and they – they run it differently and the culture is different. And like that hurts me. It hurts me like when NC State's not good. And I think players need to be. And I think in a sense, that's where Carly Lloyd was coming from. She just, I think, went about it in a wrong way. But she has like you see Mia Hamm up in the stands and she's like dying. Like you see Abby Wambach like watching games, yelling at the TV. Like it's not like they want them to lose. They want it to be great. They build something and they want it to continue to get better. And, and I think we've lost some of that with our, our national team players. And I think like, that was, like I said, that's one of the reasons they needed Ertz back so bad because like, are we devastated because I might not get a commercial or are we devastated because I let down the younger generation? I couldn't get them over the hump or I let down the country. Like it just to me is like, I think that's the part of the problem in the U S is like, as a player, are you doing it for the growth of the game? And, and that's what's important. And I know we've done things with politics. We've done things with pay equal pay. And, and they've done all these things. And I'm hoping it was all for the greater good, not just for me personally to, hey, look at my names on the thing of I did that, like kind of yeah. a thing. And I think that's how we have to build going forward. Yeah, for sure. And I think you you mentioned the Abby Wombachs and the the Mia Hams and their reaction. It's this is their baby. They built this team. This is everything that they put their heart and soul into for 20 plus years and they want to see it continue to grow and you can't blame them for that. And you know, we need to continue to support the US. We want to continue to support the US. It's a good side. It's always been a good side. It always will be, but it's now it's a new standard. And for me that's exciting because we're going to be able to follow this new team. It's not going to be the old people are going to allow to stay around. It's clear that we have to move on. And that just means new faces, new games, new tactical changes that Scotty and I get to break down. So there's plenty of World Cup soccer left to be played. Plenty of round of 16. We'll continue to cover it here. Leagues Cup is going on from MLS. There's a lot of soccer. NWSL is going to be back in full swing. The U.S. potentially will get those players back in the next few weeks. It'll be interesting to see how the league gets the U.S. players back involved. But for Scotty and I, make sure to follow us on TikTok, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Our videos always stream on YouTube at SFTP Pod. And we will see you guys back here next Wednesday. Have a great week.